the Motor City, Detroit. I've come to take the pulse of a metropolis in crisis. It's now late May, and in two weeks' time, on June 1st, the federal loans that are keeping General Motors alive will be cut off. I will not pretend the hard times are over. More jobs will be lost, more plants will close. Behind the scenes, fierce negotiations are underway. GM is desperately trying to restructure to avoid being liquidated entirely. GM has to succeed. If that were not to happen, my judgment is that this industry will collapse and drive uh, the economy into a depression. Oh my God. That would be just, just devastating. If you get 10 people and line them up and ask them, where do they work? I guarantee you they'll say Fords, Chryslers, GM, and that's exactly why they call us Motor City, because we know nothing else but the car industry. Kenny James worked building GM's cars for 37 years, earning enough for a comfortable life and to put his children through school. You feel like it's your life at GM that gave you those opportunities? Exactly. That's, that's who gave me the opportunity to dress the way I like to dress, drive the cars I like to dress, wear the jewelry I like to wear, without somebody calling me a dope dealer. You know, so hey, yeah, GM, I love them. But things have been changing in Motown for years now. This plant in Livonia is one of the many that has slashed its workforce, as locals anxiously watched on. I ride past there and I only see 20, 30 cars. So I, I stopped one day and asked him, you know, are y'all shut down or what? And he, this guy says, no, it only take 50 people to run our plant. Everything else is closed down. And how many people did it used to take to run the plant? 3,000 for, for 3,000 a day. And it's down to just 50 people now. So yes, it's real scary. It's real scary, you know, and it's, it's like that at every plant here in Michigan. And with that decline in the auto industry, there's been a slow and grinding decay in Detroit. The once grand city is falling apart. Yes, this is uh, Detroit Brewster Center. This is where um, Joe Lewis used to put on his exhibitions before he would always go out and um, box in New York. Uh, Diana Ross used to come here when she was in junior high school and uh, give little free concerts before she made it big. And uh, you can look at it now and see over the years how it's been tore up, tore down. Um, it's kind of unsafe being in here, but uh, we're taking a chance on walking the floors. The Brewster Projects is typical of much of Detroit. From these dilapidated remains, it's hard to imagine the city's former glory. This is your building, hey? Yeah, lived here for about three years. This was my home when I was growing up. One bedroom apartment. Back then, Detroit was a safer city, but nowadays it's the crime capital of America. Things are so bad that Kenny won't even be caught unarmed in his old neighborhood. Today, he's got a 357 Magnum strapped to his hip. When I was coming up, you could actually walk around the premises late at night. Nobody would mess with you. They speak to you. Um, it was real pretty, real pretty area. But uh, now, it's pathetic. Even the congregation at this church service doesn't feel safe. An armed guard is posted here to give comfort to those inside. Churches 
you know, hard buildings, anything that we would think of as sacred isn't sacred anymore. It's just a target. Before he started, this church had been robbed and vandalized, while the cars of the faithful inside were broken into while they prayed. This is the toughest time I've seen since I've been here. But today, this small congregation is trying to leave its worries behind. I don't think it's any different than anywhere else that when time does get tough, sometimes you have to remind people uh, to have faith because, uh, you know, nothing tries your faith uh, more than times like these. Jimmy Parker was an auto worker before becoming pastor, and he has both past and present GM employees among his flock. With the June 1st deadline one week away, he understands why many here will be angry with GM if they throw in the towel. When uh, a company when it seems as though they're turning their back on it does hurt. It does hurt because you put so much into it. We created the R&B, the auto industry. Like, we gave some of the best things to this country alone. Under the stage name Gift, Curtis Reynolds is continuing Detroit's other great tradition, music. I'm ecstatic to honestly say that I'm even from Detroit. Like, to even say that name, I actually wear it on my hand because I'm so proud of this city, period. And just because we down right now, that mean that that, mean that, that name got to go away? Like, I don't think so. Gift grew up along the infamous Joy Road. Like many of Detroit's youth, he couldn't get a well-paying job, and so he started hustling in the drug trade. A dirty business he says that he left behind when he picked up the microphone. We call this the Murder Mac, and this is like one of the most notorious spots on Joy Road. A lot of shootouts, a lot of just like crazy shit, so to speak, happens like right here. Gift has brought me to the spot nearby where he and his friend Chauncey were attacked by gunmen after an argument at a nightclub. When the guys hopped out, you know what I'm saying, with AKs and, you know what I'm saying, the other handguns, and they actually chased us across this parking lot, and I ran that way, and he ran this way. And when I came back to look for him, he was actually laying exactly like right here, on this hump right here, with his face, face of that way. And he uh, actually got shot like twice in the back of the head, and once to the neck, and then once to the arm. Detroit is now often called Murder City, and Gift believes that the crime and violence are only going to get worse. Yes, things have got gotten like a lot harder in the city. Whether it's because people losing their jobs, it's it's like a it's a war every day just off of that, just off of unemployment. A major reason for the crime and violence here is the fact that unemployment is already at 12% and climbing, the highest of any city in America. As the largest car manufacturer, General Motors is key to Detroit's future, because for every job on the factory floor, there can be nine others out in the community supporting the plant. Suppliers, dealers, even restaurants here are all dependent on the auto industry. And if GM collapses completely, the results could be devastating. Joanne Patterson was laid off in 2001 from a paint manufacturer that supplied the big three. And ever since, she's been in the revolving door of industry downsizing. You might not be able to get back with Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, but you're working at a job shop that makes parts for Chrysler, General Motors, Fords. They start downsizing, so you end up back out. Then you go back into another manufacturing kind of industry, and same thing happens. It's a repeat. Because of the economy, everything is going downhill right now. 
Despite eight hard years caught in the city's economic slide, Joanne believes that Detroit now has the chance to reinvent itself and the spirit to do it. Things are just going to change because you can't have everything the same way indefinitely. Nothing lasts forever. So along the way, we will have to change. Well, for the auto industry, this is not a recession. It's an absolute depression. Dave Cole has spent a lifetime as an engineer in the auto industry, and he's now the director of the Center for Automotive Research. If we had a recession, we would have 13 to 14 million units of sales. We're at less than 10 million now. And so uh, the industry has really experienced a calamitous impact from this uh, uh, depression-like environment that we're in. And what it's doing is prompting some major restructuring. In America, employers typically pay for their workers' health care and pensions. According to Cole, that means that the long legacy of America's big three car makers has now become a major problem. Uh, when you're here 100 years, you accumulate certain costs. For example, GM at one point was covering health care for over a million people. It was the largest independent coverer of health care uh, in the economy because they had uh, tens of thousands of retirees uh, and dependents. And what the big three had then is roughly a $2,000 competitive disadvantage compared to the internationals that were building cars here because they were new, new factories with relatively new people and basically no uh, retirees. And so it was kind of like running a race where uh, you're running to get somebody that has uh, track shoes and a track outfit on and you're wearing galoshes and you're carrying a bowling ball. Has anybody in this room retired April 1st? This is a meeting of the retiree section of the United Auto Workers, or UAW. The current chairman, Randy Sandusky, recently retired from GM after 31 years at the company. We've got our meetings a little bit long, which I'm sure we're all fine with because we want all the information we can get with all the things that are going on. As the June 1st deadline looms, GM is trying to cut a new pensions deal with the union. And today, Randy is shocked to hear rumors that his monthly pension could be cut in half. Why do we have to sit and worry about those things? I guess that's the other thing I like to ask them. Why do you want, we, we, we retired under the assumption that everything was gonna be okay. Randy says that the scale of this crisis has come as a shock to everyone. If you'd asked me three years ago, Randy, GM's going to go belly up. I'd have fell off the stool laughing at you. I'd say, you're out of your mind. That ain't going to happen. Not General Motors. They're going to survive whatever you're doing to them. But it certainly don't look like it now, does it? It looks bad. Dave Cole believes that the retirees have no choice but to allow GM to default on some of its major commitments. And you could say, well, it, uh, you know, the contract was there and there was an obligation of the company to do it. Uh, but the failure to deal with this, finally, this legacy cost problem, was going to essentially wipe the companies out. Uh, but, but that would is not a spectacular existed. moral failure as well as a business failure. Well, I, you know, it was, it was sort of an entitlement mentality that grew in the auto industry. As if you were an auto worker, uh, this is one of the things that you gained. You gained lifetime security in terms of a pension and health care. Uh, with a competitive environment, it was no longer possible to do that. And realistically then, if the company goes out of business, uh, what does the worker have? A few days later, union members are back again to vote on the finalized deal. It's a tough compromise that protects pensions with help from the government, but makes cuts to health benefits. And this man, Curtis McClure, is voting against it. Health care is one of the most important things that we need. And they're taking us away from the retirees. They're going to take their uh, vision and their dental. So that was one reason why I actually voted no on it. Curtis is acutely aware of the value of GM's health care coverage. He worked at the Livonia engine plant for most of his life when in 2001 he was hit by a drunk driver and seriously injured. 
And thank God to uh, my health care coverage, they were able to come in and, and provide me the best care I ever had in my life. And so I had the best of care, best of facility they had me at, and I was off for three years. Curtis is deeply disappointed that coverage may now be watered down. That's going to be devastating. Health coverage is, is one thing that we all need. In the end, the union votes to accept the new deal with GM, despite the cuts. But no one seems very happy about the way things are going. Now, I normally don't let things bother me, but it's, it's, it's starting to kick in, whereas uh, I think it's going to bother me. It turns out the UAW deal alone will not keep GM afloat. With only three days until the deadline, GM is in negotiations with its bondholders, who will have the final say on whether the company will live or die. This is a sad situation, but I mean, I, I believe the union done the best they could with the, the pill that we got. And I even think GM tried to sit down and, and, you know, eat it up too and figure it out. Even as the reality of GM's bankruptcy draws near, it's hard for people here to even contemplate it. Oh my God. That would be just, just devastating terrible thing. Unacceptable, heartbreaking. All the faith that I had in my lifetime in General Motors, I'd probably be willing to give it up for a nickel. And then for you to wait till I'm late in my life to where I can't fight back and then take it from me. I'm not going to like you very well. I'm not going to like you very well at all. The night before the June 1st deadline is a long one, and you can feel the tension everywhere in Detroit. In the morning, President Obama announces that the American government has effectively bought General Motors. Bankruptcy court is being used to save GM's most profitable assets and reforge them into a new GM. I am absolutely confident that if well managed, a new GM will emerge that can provide a new generation of Americans with the chance to live out their dreams. These are important steps on the long road to overcoming a problem. This means a cost of $50 billion to the taxpayer, 21,000 jobs lost, cuts to union benefits, and more than a dozen factories closed around America. They're already headed into a new dream and we're done. So. I mean, it, it just don't sound good. And I mean, the only thing that sounded good is we didn't hear anything about them taking our pensions from us, so. My thing is, I, I just got beat up by somebody I put 38 years in, you know? So I don't have nothing good to say right now. Then it's time for my last stop, General Motors International Headquarters in downtown Detroit. In stark, almost surreal contrast to the somber mood back at the UAW, the feeling here could be called celebratory. It's it's a, it's a very interesting day. I mean, it is uh, it, it's uh, it, it it is difficult in some respects. I mean, we work so hard to in fact avoid having to restructure ourselves under the protection of a bankruptcy court. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's in that hard work that we've discovered or rediscovered the incredible future that we can bring, that General Motors can bring to bear. GM's management is so optimistic, largely because bankruptcy will allow it to shed some of the costly union agreements made over the last 30 years. They're pushing us out. They don't want us to be, you know, organized or smart enough to know what's going on. And if you are, you need to shut up. That's the way they feel about us. It was incumbent upon us to get this thing fixed so that we could manage them at their state of dependency, okay? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is the negotiations of the UAW, pensions are preserved. They're, they're not reduced. Pensions are preserved. GM's honoring their pension plans is clearly a relief to many people I've met. But the highly valued health care will be paid out of a trust, which is hugely underfunded. Shares in the new GM will make up the shortfall. But if GM fails, so too will the retirees' health care. 
That's left many aging workers feeling that one of the most important promises ever made to them has now been broken. You know, and to those folks, say, look, we regret deeply the sacrifices that we all have to participate in. The UAW, um, certainly our dealers as we are trimming brands and, and models, certainly the communities where we're, we're announcing today the closure of plants, which are the you know, are, are kind of the bedrock of some of those communities, and certainly to our own employees who will continue to make sacrifices as well. Those sacrifices will bring more pain to the city of Detroit. Whether GM had been grossly mismanaged for decades, or whether the unions had demanded too much for too long, there's nothing people here can do now but look to the future. <laughs> So long. And you believe they will recover because you've seen them recover in the past? Absolutely. I have seen General Motors recover at least three to four times, so this is not the first time. Well, there's no question that the auto industry has a future, and I think it's going to be a very bright future. In fact, beyond this period of chaos, I think lies a, a period of uh, unusual uh, profitability for the industry. You know, we're going to keep struggling to try to get back. We're never going to be on the top again. That's, that's done. But we're not going to be counted out. I would hate to see the city just go totally under.